All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego, a bit of a heat wave in San Diego today. And I am delighted to be joined by Art Harding, who is up in the Bay Area suffering a heat wave as well, Art. Yeah. Hey, John. Well, heat wave is always relative. I'm sure the People of Arizona and Florida would make fun of us for our heat waves out here in California, but it's certainly warm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Art is the Chief Operating Officer at People.ai. And what we want to talk about today is the, is okay, sales forecasting is dead. That's the title. But what we're talking about, it's heading towards an, a, a rapid extinction. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is how forecasting needs to evolve going forward to take uh, to take into account the shifting dynamics digital transformation and all these other factors so so first off art the thesis your thesis around why forecasting is on its road to extinction on the dinosaur road yeah so i mean Look, as someone who's been in multiple aspects of a go-to-market organization with strong partnerships with our finance teams, we all know we're going to have to forecast the future of our business for the purpose of making intelligent investments in our expense dollars mm -hmm. so that we can invest smartly based on what we're projecting the business is going to do, hence the word forecast. Uh, I th The reason I take the position that I think the generation of sellers um, that are just getting started in their career are going to look back um, at all of the energy we have collectively put um, into the forecast process. Um, and if you talk to any seller across any industry, they will all recognize the concept of the forecast. Not only that, mm -hmm. they will recognize the effort that goes in every single week between them and their manager. And then all the tales between the manager and their manager as the forecast rolls up. That gave birth to a lot of people who really wanted to optimize that workflow. And we saw amazing visualization tools, improvement in data entry, and we've essentially made figuring out what we think the forecast is a, a much easier process. With the proliferation of data though, just as we've seen in other areas of our lives, I believe we're gonna move away from uh, what our conclusion is um, and asking people on this forecast call on Friday, right. when we talk about our opinions and there's going to be a big shift to other places where I think we're going to get higher yield and we're going to allow technology um, and data to, to do more of the predicting. Yeah, no, I, I would agree because let's face it. I mean, we in 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 a lot of ways, it's uh, lagging indicators have been used for forecasting for a long time, like things that you can't. Yeah, they're they're data points and they're certainly important data points, but they're not ones over which you have any control because they're lagging. You can't change course or anything like that. And I think to your point about data, I think we focus so much on lagging indicators that we haven't really looked at. How do we measure leading indicators going forward? How do we use technology to be a little bit more predictive? But at the same time, obviously, there is there is the art part as well as the science. Well, actually, <laughs> I, I, love, I love that you brought that up because I really think at the core of this conversation, is some form of a generational shift of, about what selling means. Um, if, if we look back, there's been this fun debate, is selling more art, more science? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's a debate. I think we all know that the best sellers and the best sales organizations are process driven. Mm -hmm. The question is, what we I think often mistake is some people are able to execute the process more artfully. And so they bring efficacy and style to the process, but the best always have a process. And if we accept that world-class selling is process driven, yes, there are variables, including the people we sell to, the champions we build, the economic buyers we identify, et cetera. But at the end of the day, identifying pain, qualifying opportunities and walking through the sales process and stages does give us the ability to tune and optimize our performance. The reason why I think the forecast call gets so much energy is that operating cadence was already in our DNA as mm -hmm. sales organizations. So we've just tried to use what we were already doing to take advantage of some of these technologies. Instead of rethinking, if we were going to spend an hour or two every week, would it be more valuable to be talking about pipeline performance and pipeline planning and yeah 
you know, pipeline, or would it make more sense to invest that time in the, the lagging indicator to your point, which often will get worse if our compliance and commitment to the sales process methodology and stages aren't there. And so I think as we yeah. see more investment in that process, the stages and method, our, our system should be able to do a better job of predicting. Yeah, because uh, let's face it, one of the things is, uh, I'm glad you raised process as well, because one of the things is, uh, we often talk to organizations and, you know, people that say, oh, yeah, we have a sales process. You'd be great. You know, when was the last time you, you know, revamped it, tweaked it, whatever. And they'll say, what? Well, and it's been around a while. And, and and I think that's one of the fundamental things that people need to understand is sales process is dynamic. Buyers are dynamic. The world is dynamic. So why would you have something that's uh, that you can do once and let it sit there? And I think that's the case. And you can't you can't really use technology and process if you're not if you haven't optimized the basic sales process to begin with well you know totally i think back to the point about high performers and professionals mm -hmm. uh, and whether we look at uh, olympian athletes or professional athletes or you go to artists or musicians the best of the best would arguably perform their craft very artfully and that would be the way we would describe it as wow look at look at the impact look at the style that mm -hmm. has been but if you lift up the covers of any of the greats from music to art to sport, professional or amateur, you're going to find that they didn't just show up and decide to start <laughs> playing their instrument or start competing. There was a process behind it. And it is this convergence of your understanding, not only of your process, but how to use technology to amplify the process. But that last part that you just mentioned, which is just like we've seen in agile software development and the speed at which technology companies can create and build tech. I believe as go-to-market organizations, while it may not be daily deploys of software, we may be looking at quarterly semi-annual adjustments to sales process inputs, territory designs, et cetera, as we get more and more data telling us how our process is performing with the professionals we have, you know, partnering with that process and the operators and the systems and the vendors that are trying to make this work need to be aware that this is not a once put in place and leave it, that these these processes have life cycles and we need to be evaluating those life cycles and maintaining them. Um, and I think that's one of the big opportunities for a lot of organizations is um, the long tail of, you know, when right. you set a process or a methodology up, it's not a one-time event. It's an actually ongoing responsibility to curate that process as your business changes and as you go after new markets and introduce new products. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and, and I think, and, and to be honest, Art, I, I think digital transformation is still not fully understood. It hasn't been adopted by a lot of people. Some people were paying lip service to it pre COVID. Then maybe during COVID, they realized, oops, now we're, you know, in trouble because we don't have digital processes in place. So digital transformation is this big buzzword right now. But I, I don't think a lot of people understand it. And also, we need to avoid it becoming another of those things where you just dump technology on top of inefficiency. Well, I think the key point is, is that the technology industry has been promoting digital transformation to our prospects and customers. I've worked for a number of companies that, mm -hmm. that played in the digital transformation space. But to your point, I, I think one of the easiest litmus tests to understand where someone is and their awareness of what digital transformation really is is that it's not actually usually a result of technology. It's usually a result of someone reimagining a business process. Mm -hmm. This is why we'll often see new vocabulary words created, new roles created. And then we apply the technology to that new way of thinking. Netflix, Uber, some of the classic examples, but we can look everywhere where all of the tech had already existed for some time, but it took someone to really think about a new way of doing things back to our sales process. We should be asking questions right now about why do we do QBRs? Mm -hmm. I understand why we did them 10 years ago, but why are we doing lagging indicator, retrospective reviews of our business a month into the next quarter in the quarter that we're trying to execute in versus adapting more real time? But even though we know we have technology today that might identify accounts trapped in territories that aren't being addressed from sellers, are we operationally ready to reassign territories and accounts in the middle of a year? I can tell you most organizations are not mm -hmm. aware that maybe the availability of this technology and, and data allows us to rethink everything from our annual sales kickoffs to how we onboard people to our QBR to the forecast call and really asking if the calories that we're putting into that operating cadence are purpose built for what the future of sales and marketing looks like.
Yeah, what's interesting about that too, Art, is, is if you look back, as you said, I mean, if you just stripped away all the technology for a moment and went back, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years, uh, a lot of it's still the similar, you know, the forecasting, the forecasting calls, the the forecasting being sort of a little bit of data and a little bit of uh, gut instinct and all of that. And a lot of that hasn't, as you said, it, it hasn't really changed. We've just used maybe technology to to make it easier to follow a, an old process. So it's like taking, I guess, class, you know, school rooms and trying to just add technology into them as opposed to looking at, is this the most effective way to educate the current generation? Well, uh, an analogy, um, I never try to project if anyone's uh, of my age to be able to know this or <laughs> recall this, but I remember when online banking first started yeah. to emerge um, in the, the mid nineties, late nineties, early 2000s. And if you had asked me as a consumer what I wanted in the digital transformation of banking, I would have told you I wanted something to help me balance my checkbook faster. I would have told you a, a, a bunch of things about how to make the way I used to bank better, mm -hmm. not realizing that in an always on connected tapping digital world, I'm going to see my balance reconciled immediately. <laughs> so the idea, right, yeah. you know, reconcile. So I think we need to be careful that Technology can certainly help make an old way of doing things better, faster, but where the high yield, where the big impact that I think we all romantically love about technology plays and companies are when we reimagine doing things. And so how much of our sales capacity and how much of our sales productivity could we reclaim to reinvest for doing business with customers and prospects versus what I call doing business with ourselves? Mm -hmm. And I, I think there are a lot of artifacts that made sense when you had to drive into the office, make a manual photocopy, staple them together and hand them out for a meeting before it started. I understand why we might do a QBR um, with all the effort that went to. In today's world, can we be a little faster? Can we look more into the future sooner? And can't we focus more on our leading indicators than, than doing the retrospect yeah. on what happened? And I also think, uh, Art, is that uh, part of it too is I think sometimes companies that look at say oh they have an issue like this and then they say oh look there's a company over here which got a technology that's promising if you implement this your forecasting issues are over and we go okay so we go for solving the big things we think solving the big problems and maybe even reducing the people is the right way to go as opposed to saying well let's have a look at all of these things that we're asking salespeople to do today, let's try and get rid of all those road routine tasks that they're doing. And let's get them back to high value activities where if you're in the high value activity, you know, quadrant, you're more likely to have a better sense of your future business anyway. Yeah, I think I, I love the pattern that you just laid out there, which is it's almost getting a little cliche. Every time we see technology move into the forefront, the first rumor is that this technology is going to only displace people and remove mm -hmm. people and drive efficiencies. And we never seem to, I guess, believe or have faith that there's actually going to be new responsibilities, roles, and opportunities mm -hmm. created. For example, I know many of us view the go-to-market technology space as something that was put here to make our lives easier and better as sellers. I think the right way and leaders, I think the right way to look at it is it's not here to make us our lives easier. It's actually here to give us more capabilities, bigger, uh, maybe more influence and power over our profession of selling. Mm -hmm. But also with that comes more responsibility. Our customers are expecting us to show up more informed. Our customers are expecting us to have digital capabilities. So I, I think we should look at this digital transformation of sales and marketing as a tremendous opportunity to create the next wave. And absolutely some roles and some things we used to do are gonna go away, but they will be displaced with higher value, higher impact activities and capabilities. So the question is, where are you as either a leader um, early in your sales career or as a decision maker in terms of where you're investing? Are you only looking to just make something faster, cheaper? Or are you actually looking to unlock a new capability around your buyer customer journey? Yeah, and also then the use of obviously the use of of technology to bring you closer to your customers and prospect to bring that human element back because that's really what people are craving. It's all over. It was it was happening pre COVID, but COVID obviously um, I think accelerated that. And and it's funny because if you go back to your banking example earlier, 
the banks are a classic example of how they have pushed you further and further and further away, right? And made it harder and used technology to make it harder and harder and harder for you to feel like there's anybody who cares about what's going on with your with your finances when you you try to connect with people. And I think that's the that's the real uh, crux here is to use the technology to get closer to your customers, to build better relationships with them, to be more human with them as opposed to the opposite. Well, the, the other analogy I'll often use is a, a health and fitness one. And you talk about people grabbing for tools quickly. And um, my wife would be the first one to tell you that whenever I go on a health and fitness kick, I always have an idea of a new tool that I need to buy that's going to unlock the next chapter of my health and fitness. When in fact, she'll often remind me that our health and fitness is the result of your leading indicators, which is the calories you eat in your workout routine, which might be our sales process and methodology. But yeah. boy, do we like to buy new scales with new digital syncing and you know, the ab, the ab ripper, the shake weight, the Chuck Norris home gym. If we just get that new tool, it'll unlock all of our health and fitness. And then you look at products that have merged the human element with the ability to provide us better telemetry, better community, better engagement. And we've seen people change the results that people do get with health and fitness, but it often still involves people, right? Um, I don't mm -hmm. think many of us are failing because our health and fitness isn't fast or cheap enough. So no, <laughs> no, I would agree. It's about it's the accountability. It's the accountability piece that always is the is the part that gets you. So um, where do, where do you see this? Where do you see this going, Art? Because I really do think uh, I, I think you're correct, and I think there's some companies are going to figure this out quickly, and they're going to have a distinct advantage in the market, but especially now the kind of where we are with the economy, where we are with the expectations, where you know path to profitability for companies or profitability, all of those things are much more important um, now than perhaps they were, um, you know, a year or two ago when there's plenty of money available if you wanted to buy revenue. But now you've got to actually figure things out. So your forecasting becomes even more critical. Yeah. So when you say, where is this going? Um, I'll expand the concept of just the forecast into mm -hmm modernized sales and marketing. So I find digital transformation runs the risk of people's eyes glazing over. So I, I just try, <laughs> try to simplify it and say, I believe the modernized sales and marketing engine and services, by the way, I actually believe the post sales customer journey is as much a part of your pipeline engine and your customer and future revenue engine, particularly in subscription models um, Absolutely. Uh, in, the, in the business, whether it's technology or non-tech. So I believe that the platform of cloud and the invention of, or not invention, but the, the real proliferation of subscription-based purchasing triggered two things over the past 10 or 12 years or so. As people who sell, um, here at People AI, we sell to people with 10-year-old CRMs, 20-year-old CRMs, you know, lots of different industries. It's pretty clear to me as an ex-operator, um, as well as someone who uh, works with a lot of prospects and customers, that somewhere around 2010, there was a noticeable shift in how people were building out their infrastructures and they were buying more cloud native applications. They were signing up for subscriptions with very low expense entry fees. And what this enabled were teams that used to have to go to an IT department that was running hard, disciplined engineering practices yep. because of the physical constraints of data centers and replication and backups and servers. So you had to get in line to ask the IT department to stand up your on-prem CRM, et cetera, as well as any other tech project. Flash forward to 2010 to 2022, and what you see is because of the low entry subscription model and the fact that the cloud made all that infrastructure noise, um, something that, that the business didn't have to worry about, we saw this proliferation of new capabilities that yep. buyers could be in the business, CMOs, CROs, post-sales leaders. So we've seen this explosion of new digital capabilities that might not have happened as quickly without that factor of this, these subscription expenses in the cloud. Um, just because we can doesn't mean we should. So we move mm -hmm. really quickly as an industry. And I think we've all woken up with a garage of a lot of different well-intended tools, right? Yep. And now the question is, who's going to figure out based on their business, where they are from a maturity perspective, where they are, whether they're a, an industry leader that's you know looking to increase market share, whether they're an emerging challenger, um, what vertical are you in, should start to give you signals in terms of how you're going to prioritize not just having these tools, but actually rationalizing their impact on your business. Um, so we hear things like people are logging into too many tools or adoption of them so poor, our data is bad. 
and it always it often feels like there that there's a conversation about what's going on out there i think it's time for us in operations as well as revenue leadership positions to start thinking a little bit like product managers that are bringing digital capabilities to our customers through the buyer and customer journey they happen to help the people who work at our company as well but the reason we should be making these investments is it makes the buyer and customer journey competitive differentiated more valuable for them and therefore more valuable for us. And I, I really think the companies that figure it out are going to realize we have a ton of innovation that we've gotten to see. It exploded very quickly. But now back to your point, you can't just buy revenue. We also just can't throw technology because it makes our mm-hmm. lives better. We have to, I think the North Star has to be that buyer and customer, not which department we're in. No, and I, and I think that's a great, I think that's an excellent point uh, and really a, a big takeaway from here because I totally agree with you. It, sometimes it feels like I, I worked years ago with this person who had an addiction to QVC or the Home Shopping Network or one of those. And she literally, she readily admitted that she would sit up at night and she'd order stuff and half of it sat in her house, still in the packaging. And that is honestly what the technology space has been like for all of these proliferation of sales and marketing and lead generation tools as people have just gone mad. You'll have people buying them. They don't have to go through IT. So I can buy my own. I can subscribe. And then you end up with a lot of tools. Somebody uses one really well. Somebody else has used another. One doesn't get used at all. And you're right. It's all we've done is uh, literally like this woman is just stack up our room with uh, items we don't need. And we never thought about how we would actually use them. Yeah, it's it's interesting because we also know that we have to invest. So the question Mm -hmm. becomes, do you actually have the team? And, And we've seen this. I don't know if, if it's a resurgence of operations or you know the rev ops, the integrated yeah. ops, the centralizing, the moving it around, enablement and operations. And I really think that that's companies reacting yeah. to the fact that they can sense that they need the frontline management, the enablement team and the operations team all working together. And if your operations team reports into a specific silo, marketing, sales, or services, your budgets are allocated mm-hmm. by all those. Your customer has to work across all three of those, by the way, so do prospects. Yeah. But if all the investments on all the operators and all the teams are there to optimize just their function, that's when you get this really siloed, like, I don't know, marketing's green, yeah. <laughs> sales says, we're green, <laughs> right? Post sales, everything's green over here. Um, you know, I, I think taking that more integrated. One of the things we do see with digital transformation is you'll often see um, more integration of simple business process. Uh, and so I'll, when I talk to CMOs and CROs and they talk about alignment, I will often highlight if you're still arguing about alignment <laughs> in sales, you, you, you haven't reached integration because there are other companies that yeah. are aligned <laughs> and they're yeah. already integrating at the process level. Right? Yeah, no, no, I, I I totally agree with you. I love I love the I love saying I've been saying this for the years now. I love saying like, oh, it's now 2022. Why are we talking about sales and marketing alignment? You know, why are we still talking about sales and marketing? Alignment? And to your point, yeah, if you don't have that alignment in in place, then that's where you need to start. Uh, so um, listen, Art, this has been fantastic. All of Art's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please tell people a little bit more about you and People uh, AI. Sure. Uh, Art Harding, CEO of People. AI. I've been here uh, three years uh, after being a customer for a few years where I ran uh, go-to-market strategy and operations for a cloud company called New Relic. Uh, my responsibilities are across the entire buyer and customer journey. So if you're a customer of People. AI or a prospect, I'm never the wrong person to reach out to. Uh, and People. AI is all about optimizing pipeline. Um, we try to help ensure that you're ready for modernized pipeline planning and ultimately pipeline performance management. So if you're interested in planning or pipeline performance, People that are the right people to speak to. Um, John, I'd be remiss if I didn't finish with the irony as a company called People AI, as we feel after all this investment we've made with all of these technologies, at the end of the day, people still do buy from people. So do you know who you need to sell to and which accounts? We'd love to help you with that. Yeah, absolutely. I encourage people to go check it out. As as Art says, yes, at the end of the day, you can strip away all of the, the jargon, the new technologies. And at the end of the day, people still buy from people. So listen, thanks again, Art. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again really soon. Thank you. Thank you.